Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we're going to be venturing into the world of the paranormal, unexplained things and all manner of creepy and odd stories. So I hope you're ready because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. In 2012, I suffered a massive stroke that ended my life. As I slipped away, I'd felt an overwhelming peace come over me like I'd never had before. Things went black. Then I was ascending above and saw the city below. Next to me, I heard a voice from this orb of varied colored lights that also had a mist coming off it. It was a woman's voice and she was telling me how excited she was to finally be with her family and see her mum and dad again. I started to feel unsure and told her I wasn't supposed to be here. Suddenly I was standing in an otherworldly place that was gorgeous. All the structures and buildings were made of what looked similar to marble, but had an iridescent color between the marbling. The buildings were decorated with colorful stones with gold embezzlement lining the buildings and glass fencing. I walked along the path with my arms crossed and holding them to my body. I felt lost and everyone around me was chattering happily with each other in these otherworldly clothes of satin like linens. Some people held hands and were close and joyful with each other. This place was absolutely beautiful. I came upon an old man who was sitting near a tree and what seemed to be teaching a class with people surrounding him. Some were sitting and others were standing. He called me over to join him. He was teaching the lesson of what life is supposed to be on earth, what it was originally supposed to be, and how humans were supposed to be caring for the world and the inhabitants on it. But materialism had gotten in the way among other things. I felt an overwhelming knowledge come over me as he continued to teach his class about the world, the universe, life and death. Everyone began to surround me and the old man. He put his hands on my shoulder and he said, it's not your time yet. You will know when it is. The people from the class all came in and held me in a circle. And suddenly I was back. I opened my eyes and breathed in. I was alive and back in my earthly body. This is how I came to believe in God and also reincarnation. I don't claim a religion because my beliefs are now a mix of things. Unfortunately, slowly, that knowledge that was instilled into me slowly sipped away over the years, but I felt it in the back of my mind. To me, religion became several fingers pointing to the same being. I don't need a religion to dictate my relationship with God. If you're wondering, I'm 27 now and suffer residual effects that have disabled me, but I keep going. My body may not work properly, but my brain still does. And I focus on expanding my knowledge in various areas. A few years back, I was at my grandmother's funeral my dad, brother and I had all gotten there early because we'd made good time in traffic. So we were waiting for my extended family. We ended up wandering around the cemetery. My brother and I were trying to find the oldest grave. Weird, I know, but my whole family are big history nerds and graveyards can be pretty cool as long as you're respectful and stay on the paths. We walked past this one grave and I just immediately felt awful. I became extremely cold and nauseous, even though it was warm and sunny. My breath caught in my throat and I could no longer breathe and my vision started spotting and it all went dark. I thought I was going to pass out and then it just stopped just as quickly as it had started and I felt fine. My brother was still saying whatever he was saying before I missed about a sentence and hadn't noticed anything. I didn't tell him about it, figuring he wouldn't believe me. So I just said we should head back before the funeral began. I probably would have dismissed the incident, except the next spring, my brother and I were hanging out and climbing trees in a park. It had a lot of tall grasses you see in prairies 
and a good number of trees as it backed up onto the woods. I started climbing a tree, I'd gone up a few times before, and then I got hit by the same feeling. It was the sudden nausea, inability to breathe, and vision fading out. It was identical to what I felt at the cemetery. I dropped out the tree and had to sit down until it passed. After that, I convinced my brother to leave because I felt sick, even though after it passed, I felt fine. They found a body in the woods by the park a few weeks later, mostly decomposed because it had been out there all winter. Creeped me out beyond belief, and I've never had that feeling since. I had a school trip to the concentration camps in Germany and Austria. I remember arriving at the first camp on our itinerary, Dachau. When we got off the bus, they told us to get the banners, flags, and flowers, and to put them at the front as a memorial. I got the peace flag. It was a rainbow flag with a big peace sign on it. When we were in front of the gate, I remember feeling incredibly overwhelmed and being stared at. It was a creepy feeling, but I didn't mind it. As we walked through the gate, the first thing I saw was the window on the barrack I had in front of me. I saw a bald, beaten up man in the prisoner's blue and white uniform. We stared at each other for at least five seconds and he looked at the flag I was holding. I blinked and the man wasn't there anymore. I didn't really mind it because I believe in the supernatural and I expected that to happen. The tour guide afterwards gave us a device to put on our ear for us to hear him better. As he was speaking, telling us about his father's experience, as he was a child of an ex-prisoner there, my ear device started having problems. I started hearing only static sounds, so I decided to remove it. But before I was able to do this, I heard a man's voice saying words I couldn't understand, and the aura of his voice was so creepy and so angry. I was so shocked and creeped out, because he seemed angry at me. I removed my earpiece quickly, and moved on with the others. I'm the only foreigner in our class, so the explanation I give to myself for the earpiece thingy was that it was the man, and he was angry at me for being there. I have several scary stories, but this one is particularly fresh as it just happened the other day. I went for a bit of a walk because we're allowed to exercise, came back, went to put my key in the door, and I've always had this thing where I hate, hate static shocks. So I very lightly touch the doorknob with the tip of my finger, and the doorknob suddenly turned to the side like someone was about to leave the house at that instant. I opened the door expecting to have a laugh about it, and no one was on the other side. I've since tried to replicate it. The doorknob is a bit looser on the other side, but the side that faces outwards is sturdy, and was a feathered light touch on my part. In order to wrench the doorknob like that, you'd need to grip it and twist. Still can't explain it. But given that I see shadows move around the house and random things fall over, people have independently commented on the weird vibe of the two downstairs rooms without prompting, and a video once unpaused for me the second I walked through my door, I'm beginning to wonder if there's something inhabiting it other than myself. My earliest memory is an overheard view of the house I grew up in roughly 30 to 40 feet above the intersection. And it showed me a crawl of words that told me the address, my name, my family's names, and ended with a message like good luck or something I quite can't remember. Then I remember being carried upstairs. And a few moments later, we had a blackout on the street. Another one was when I was a bit older. I used to walk and run around the woods behind our house. Every so often I'd hear my name get called out. So I'd return to ask anyone who was there, or if they called my name. Usually I got a confused look or thought you were in your bedroom. Eventually I figured it was my imagination and ignored it. It disappeared for a few weeks, but came back during an attempt to go further than I ever have. I was about two miles in. The voice called faintly behind me. I looked back and saw nothing and carried on. 
a few more feet, and the voice got louder, kind of angry sounding. I ignored it, and then it screamed at me, and I felt something similar to getting punched in the chest, and promptly turned around. There are some spooky things, but those are the most interesting. My mother and her cousins often played together as children. Although as a rule, none of them were supposed to be out after dark. One day, when she was around six or seven years old, she and three of her cousins were playing hide and seek. They were enjoying themselves so much, they didn't notice the sun was starting to set while the full moon was rising. Mama was it during this game, and after she finished counting, she went looking for her cousins. She found most of them. Except Linda. After some time, Mama found Linda hiding behind a tree near a shaded area in the forest that was a little deeper than she was used to going, even if it was near her house. It was quite unusual, since she and the other children had been told by the adults to never go deep into the woods because they could get lost or taken by the spirits of the forest. Even though Mama was still a child. She could see why the adults had warned her, and the other children away from the deeper parts, with bamboo, mango, and other trees. It would be dark in some places, even in broad daylight. But now that it was night, it was beyond pitch black, and Mama was starting to get the creeps. Psst! Startled, Mama looked to her left, and thanks to a sliver of moonlight that managed to peek through some of the branches overhead. Saw Linda partially hidden behind a tree. She had a mischievous grin on her face and was beckoning to Mama to come closer. Linda, my mother was flabbergasted. What are you doing there? We're not supposed to go beyond the tree line, and you're not supposed to be giving away your hiding spot. Linda didn't answer, only continued to silently beckon to Mama, but she didn't move. A chill ran down her spine. And began to spread through her body as she continued to stare at her cousin. Something wasn't right. She knew it. Her cousin's normally chubby face looked angular, elongated, and her mischievous smile became sinister as she emerged from her place behind the tree, which she soon realized was a belet tree, notorious for being the residence of evil spirits. She also noticed that Linda seemed to be growing taller with each step, and even though she wanted to run, she couldn't even move and barely scream. The figure that had taken her cousin's face lurched forward, bending over so that it almost resembled a hunchbacked witch, its eyes gleaming. Suddenly, the sound of rustling leaves and snapping twigs broke the silence. A mama felt someone grab her shoulder before she was yanked backwards away from the evil that intended to steal her away. When she looked up at her savior, she found herself looking into the eyes of her uncle Simon, who was Linda's father. He had one hand on his shoulder as he moved to stand between her and the sharpshooter that wore his daughter's face, with a machete in his other hand. Mama peered around him. And found the being backing away slowly, until it fully disappeared into the shadows from whence it came. Without a word, her uncle picked her up with one arm and carried her back the way she had come, while she hid her face in his shoulder, not wanting to look at the darkness that could have been her grave. After some time, she found herself being carried into the threshold of her home, her parents looking furious, her various aunts. And uncles, worried, looking at her. All her cousins from earlier, Linda included, were sitting on the bamboo seats, trembling, with tears running down their faces. After her uncle Simon set her down, he asked her what happened, and why she had gone that deep into the forest. She explained what happened, noticing the terrified looks on the cousins' faces as they listened. While the adults became even more tense than they had already been, when she was done recounting her experience, her uncle Simon told her that Linda had encountered someone she thought was Mama while she was hiding, only to realize it wasn't her. 
She had run screaming from her hiding place, telling him and the others what she'd seen. And when they found Mama's slipper, which she hadn't realized she'd lost while searching, Uncle Simon had told Linda's elder sister to take her and the other children to my grandparents. My mother and her cousins got quite a scolding for playing past sundown, but Mama always felt that it was worth it, since she wouldn't have been alive to tell the tale if Uncle Simon had gotten there a few minutes later. Ever since that night, she's always made sure to keep an eye on the sun when she has her cousins playing, so that they can go in before dark. The next story takes place in my father's ancestral home in his hometown, which is a place where no one wants to try and make a life beyond its boundaries. The house is now abandoned and lies in ruins. These events took place three to four years before he passed away. I was already an adult in my late twenties. I was temporarily staying there with my father while waiting for news on the various job applications I had sent out online since my last job in the city had stressed me out so much, my health had gone downhill, so I had to leave to recuperate. The house was already old and in the state of disrepair, and I have to tell you I was praying for the day that I could leave, because not only were we living a hand-to-mouth existence, but my father is domineering and has a controlling attitude. It was really grating on my nerves. He kept rubbing it in my face that we were surviving on his retirement pension, since I was too weak to hold the job for a year. And he even had the audacity to tell me that I should let him manage the inheritance from my late mother's estate once it was released. He wanted to use it to set up a business, mainly because he wanted me to live out my days in that dead end town that he called home when nothing happened and no one wanted to leave their comfort zone. What he didn't know was that I would never let him touch what was mine. I was basically the maid at home doing all the cooking, cleaning, laundry, the works. I was also constantly being humiliated by our father to the relatives that we have and acquaintances, since I am and still mostly a loner. The only people I could really talk to being a few cousins who were also outcasts like me. He may have been my father, but he should never have been allowed to raise kids, since loving and nurturing has never been something he understood. It was always about control. You are his puppet, doing his bidding. As I mentioned, the house was old and falling into disrepair. At the time of this story that I'm about to tell you, it was no secret that the house was haunted. Even when my grandparents and other cousins resided there during my high school days, but they aren't the ones I'm going to share with you. On many occasions, I would see people walking through the house, but when I would turn to look at them, there was no one there. The passing visitors weren't just limited to human beings. Many times I even saw the animals. I had one come close to me, visit after their precious lives had been cruelly cut short all in the name of finger foods that should have been eaten to go with the booze. It was almost as if my four legged friends were coming to see me one last time before going to their eternal reward. And when I told my cousins whom I was close to about them, they said it was because those creatures remembered the kindness I had showed to them and knew that I loved them. There was one apparition in particular that seemed to follow me around all the time that of a little boy, about three years old. When I would be cleaning the yard, I'd see him from the corner of my eye sitting on a bench, or standing a few feet away watching me. However, he would be gone once I turned my head to look at him. Whenever I was in the kitchen preparing a meal, he would be peering at me from around the kitchen door. He was mostly a blurry figure, like what you see on the old TV screens when the signal's bad and I could never see his face, but knew he was there. Once around dusk, my father was out talking to his friends and I was upstairs folding the clothes that I had gotten off the clothesline since they were dry. When from the corner of my eye, I saw that child and he began to inch closer to me as if curious as to what I was doing. I didn't feel threatened by him and spoke to him gently, hoping that I could give him comfort in some way. The next day, I went to my cousin Leela's house. 
She and her siblings, along with their mother, Susan, are fellow outcasts like me, but for different reasons. Technically, they're paying for a sin that was committed by their matriarch. Susan is my eldest cousin on my father's side, so Leela and her siblings are my nieces. Leela, though, is my age, and Anna is five years my junior. But I look at them all as cousins, no big deal. I told Leela, her younger sister Anna, and their mother Susan about the little boy I kept on seeing, and they all became very quiet before exchanging a long look. Leela told me that it's known behind closed doors that Susan's half-sister Victoria had several extramarital affairs and many abortions afterwards. The latter were all performed at the ancestral house. They said that the little boy might be one of the children who paid for their mother's sins with their lives, and he clearly took a liking to me. Because even though I'm not a mother, I'd never hurt a child. That little boy was my constant companion when I wasn't visiting Leela up until June 2014, when I started a new job in a city almost 12 hours away from where my father lived. Leela and Anna were also able to start a new chapter of their lives in a city 13 hours away from that pit we were stuck to, two months after I left. We still keep in touch and remain close as ever, because in my eyes, they, along with the maternal uncle, I have a soft spot, and my sister and her three children are the only family I have left now. My father passed February 2016, and when I went to attend the funeral service and tie up the loose ends he had left, I saw the house had continued to deteriorate after I was gone, and I was glad. I had always felt like the life and whatever courage I had to try to hold on to after my mother died when I was 12 was being drained from me the entire time I'd stayed there. The house is now in ruins, completely abandoned, and the trees and plants that thrived when I was there have since withered. To start off, I'll tell you the story about my grandma and seeing stuff. Before she was paralyzed from the lower part of her chest and down, she had three kids, my dad, my aunt, and my uncle, and their house was pretty old. My grandpa works from 6am to 8pm, seven days a week, so he was never home. When my dad would be in his crib, my grandma out of the corner of her eye would see a figure standing over my dad. My grandma never had the feeling of being scared, she just called the figure his guardian angel. No one believes my grandma besides me. When I was 16, one of my ex-girlfriends and I were over at my house, and we were just talking. We came through the garage of my house, we turned on the hallway light, and walked to the living room, which was out of sight of the garage, hallway, and laundry room. We decided to leave again, and so we walked back to the garage, and I noticed that the hallway light is off, and the laundry room light is on. I tell people this story, and they don't believe me, or they say it's just some false wiring. But this did happen. The lights are two different colours, so I would know the difference. Some ghost was trying to mess with me. I hear footsteps all the time as well in my house, but I learnt to ignore them. This happened a while ago, 2013. I used to be able to astral project through meditation. I never really had any control of where I travelled. I would just automatically end up where I did. I would always end up in a barren forest in the dead of winter, everything covered in almost a foot of snow. I only travelled there two times without any incidents. I would just wander around a while before coming back to my body. Then I encountered the creature that stopped me from ever going back. The third time I travelled to the forest, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I wandered around a bit, walking in a random direction. I stopped for a minute and looked around. I spotted a dark shape, about six or seven feet away from me. It was this pure black wolf, staring right at me. I wasn't afraid, for whatever reason. And the wolf turned, and started walking away from me, but stopped after walking about a foot. It looked back at me, as if beckoning me to follow it, and follow the wolf I did. 
I followed the wolf for what felt like 20 minutes. It led me to a clearing in the woods I had never been to before. As soon as I stepped into the clearing, the wolf ran back into the woods. I watched it run off and then looked around the clearing. The atmosphere, which had felt completely normal up until this point, shifted once I saw what was standing on the other end of the clearing. It was like a pressure pushing me down. The air itself felt heavy. What was standing on the other end of the clearing was a tall humanoid creature. Its skin appeared black, pitch black. It had cloven hooves for feet, but no fur on its body. Its body was incredibly thin, to the point of being able to see its ribs. Its arms were abnormally long. Its hands ended in long talons. It had these crooked, jutting horns. I couldn't for some reason make out any facial features except for its eyes. They were bright, glowing red. I was terrified and stood there for what felt like a minute or so. This creature and I were just staring at each other before I snapped back to my body. After I returned to my body, I felt like I was out of breath and couldn't stop trembling for a good while. I was understandably pretty shaken up. I tried for some research, but Google wasn't yielding the answers I was looking for. I spoke with a few acquaintances who supposedly had more experience and knowledge in these matters than I did, and got some advice, which looking back now on the events that happened, was not very good advice. A few weeks after my initial encounter, I decided to return to the forest. Before going back, I formed a salt circle around myself as I was advised, as a protective measure. I entered my meditative state and found myself back in the forest more specifically, but in the clearing, where I had the first encounter with the creature. Immediately, I felt the pressure and heaviness in the air. Only this time, it was worse. My back was turned away from the clearing, facing the trees. I could feel the presence of the creature right behind me. Remembering the advice that was given to me, I summoned as much resolve and courage as I could, and made what I know now was a huge mistake. I spoke to it, trying to keep my voice as steady and commanding as I could. Despite being terrified, I said, You have no power over me. Silence stretched for what was probably only a few minutes, as I waited for something to happen, or a response of some kind. What I didn't expect to happen was that the creature reached out and touched me. Have you ever been burned badly? I once burnt part of my hand with an iron once, and that was the closest thing I can compare the sensation to. The creature grabbed my neck, its talon hand encompassing the whole of my neck. It hurt so much I couldn't even find it within myself to scream. The next thing I knew, I was back in my body, still feeling a slight burn in my neck, but only a phantom of what I felt before. There were no marks left behind, just the memory of the feeling. I tried to put the experiences from my mind, just forget all about it and go about my life. After all, I had a part-time job and community college classes to worry about. Everything seemed normal until about a week later. Going about by day, I would catch small glimpses of the creature for mere split seconds. I was of course alarmed, and my distress only became worse when I came to a horrifying realization. Each time I caught a glimpse, the creature would be ever so slightly closer. I tried to once again find answers to what happened through internet searches, but found nothing that appeared helpful, nor could tell me what I was dealing with. After a few days of dealing with this, things got even worse, as they usually do. I began to hear whispers as if they were coming from inside my head. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying, but it unnerved me greatly. As the creature grew slowly closer, the whispers grew louder. In desperation for help, I turned to my mother. My mother is a religious woman, and after I explained everything that had happened and was happening, she was extremely concerned. She immediately called the pastor of her church who came to the house. 
with the church's youth pastor as well. They prayed over me, spoke to me about spiritual warfare, because they assumed what I was dealing with was a demonic being. After the visit from the pastor, I did stop seeing the creature, but the whispers grew in volume and took a very aggressive turn. It began to wear on me and my sanity. My partner at the time claimed to know what the creature was and how to stop its influence in my life. I'm desperate to try anything to rid myself of this being. So I went along with what he said. I won't provide details about the ritual we performed as it was dangerous. And I don't want anyone attempting such a thing. But it evidently worked. It's been about seven years since all of this happened. And I haven't seen, dreamt, nor felt the creature's presence or influence in my life since. Moral of the story, please be careful when you astral project. This encounter happened when I was about eight years old, living in McAllister, Oklahoma. I know what you may think, because this is going to sound very bizarre and being such a young child. You may assume it's an overactive imagination. However, I am certain that these events happened that night. And it was more than the overworkings of a childhood mind. One night I woke up in my bedroom that me and my younger sister Autumn shared at the time. There was a faint bit of light in the room that was illuminated from the lights from the park that sat in the backyard of my house. When I awoke, I adjusted my eyes and noticed a dripping dark spot on the wall. I couldn't tell what it was, but it looked like blood. And from the spot, there were steady drips that dripped down to the floor but vanished completely, just inches from the floor. Not understanding what I was looking at, I awoke my sister, whom slept on a separate twin bed at the opposite end of the bedroom. After I shook her awake, and she became focused, I asked her if she saw what I was seeing. She saw it too. It was just a solid, thick, dark blob dripping down the wall. Unable to figure out just what we were looking at, I decided to turn on the bedroom light. I turn around to head in the opposite side of the room where the light switch was located. And after about two feet, I run into what I can only describe as a wall. But the issue is there isn't supposed to be a wall there. Confused, I'm explaining to my sister that there's something blocking my entry to the other side of the wall. I begin trying to feel this wall that was just mysteriously there. But I can't see the area as it was too dark, which was weird, because there's a lot of light that illuminated the room. And I should have been able to at least make out some detail. While feeling this wall, I could feel that it had ledges and that I could climb it. So I did. I was able to climb it all the way until I climbed to the ceiling and hit my head. I climbed back down, still needing to get to the light switch, but there was a way to try and get to the other side of the room. In this bedroom, there was a closet which stretched the entire length of the wall. It was a big elongated closet that had two open cased doors on each end of the wall. So I told my sister to wait there and that I was going to the closet. The door nearest to us walked down to the opposite end and came out to the other door, which was right by the light switch in the bedroom door. So that's what I did. And I was able to make it to the other side. Once on the other side, I felt for the door and found it. But I noticed something strange. When I turned and looked towards the side of the room that my sister had slept on, which was right by the window too, and illuminated the entire room. I didn't see the window, which I should have been able to. Still, I needed to find that light switch and shine some light on the matter. The light switch was just left of the bedroom door. So I felt the door once more and the knob. And I knew that I was close and it was just a tad further. The strangest thing occurred. All I could feel was the bottom of the switch plate. I was plenty tall enough to reach the light with the greatest of ease. However, no matter if I stood on my tiptoes or jumped as high as I could, the light switch was just outside of my reach. 
Now it's time to explain the most bizarre part of the whole encounter that I can remember. While struggling to reach the light switch, I stumbled and fell forwards. And when I did, I was seeing inside the living room, which would mean the bedroom door was wide open. And if it was, it would have been obvious because the living room was lit with a window which was illuminated by a street light that shined through the living room window. There was also a VCR with a bright digital interface that my dad never set the clock to. So it constantly flashed to 12. It was well lit in the living room, and I could make out the furniture, coffee table and the like. As I'm laying face down on the floor staring into the living room, I'm wondering how this is. The door had to be shut. So I looked over my shoulder and the bedroom door was shut, which was painted white and was clearly noticeable due to the bright color and the amount of light I had. But somehow I'm in the middle of it like the door was a hologram. I can't run through the living room and get my parents because their bedroom is just off the living room. But I have this gut instinct, I guess. So my only thought is I pull myself back through my bedroom and I pull myself back and everything goes dark. I'm face to face with the closed door again and I begin to feel the door shut. Not knowing what else to do, I make my way through the closet and find my sister still sitting on the other side of the bed and the light shining through the window, which verified me that something was blocking the entire room. I tell her I can't turn on the light and she didn't know what to do. She tells me to touch the wall, not the mysterious wall that just appeared out of nowhere, but the wall that in the beginning was bleeding. As I touch the wall, I get what feels like an electrical shock, but it doesn't hurt. It just throws me back and lands me on my back. Feeling completely out of options and scared out my mind. My final conclusion is to lay with my sister in bed, hoping to make each other feel safe and a little less scared. And we both cried ourselves to sleep. I woke up next morning and thought, wow, what a strange dream. Then realized I was still in bed with my sister and the bedroom was back to normal. After she awoke, she was able to record the night's events. I've spoken to a famous paranormal investigator about this about 10 years ago. He told me he believes at that point, I felt through the door and had a strange feeling of not going through and seeking my parents. He believed it was my guardian angel looking over me. If I'd have completely crossed the threshold, I could have been caught in another dimension, never to return. I have a gift that's a blessing and a curse. Things will just come to me suddenly and I will tell them to people and sometimes they get angry, but later they will come back to me even years later and say, Hey, guess what? You were right. I also get premonitions when the phone is about to ring and I think of the person and what they're going to talk about. And then the phone will ring about 30 seconds after. And often when I'm thinking of someone before I interact with them unexpectedly, it's like their energy is meeting my energy before I even knew they're going to speak to me. The man that I was with on and off for for 20 years, he and I definitely had a connection. It was a little creepy sometimes. For a long time, we were only corresponding by letter and our thoughts would cross each other as if we were thinking at the same time, even though we had no real way to communicate. I also can feel when someone is thinking about me, especially if it's a guy that likes me that I just met and I'm not around them. Lots of other mystical stuff in my life, but I consider them spiritual gifts because I'm Christian and don't think of myself as any type of medium or psychic or anything like that. I had a really strange experience on my Facebook page for empaths. One day, someone posted a photo and asked if someone could read it. Then it turned into a bunch of people posting different photos of themselves or other family members or pets. You didn't even know who they really were. They were just people on that page that felt they had the powers of a medium and they would try to express what they thought from the photos. But a lot of them were very vague and random and sometimes completely off point. I, on the other hand, seemed to have a deeper understanding of the people just from looking at them. It was as if I was able to read their spirit, their desires, their feelings, and their situation from just the picture. People began to reach out for me for more information from all over, and I had to put a stop to it. 
because it's not really a path I wanted to take. I've had other experiences like that, and I don't believe that they are anything to do with me. I believe there is just a lot of energy transferred between people, and we are all the same kind of energy. We just aren't aware of it. People who have crossed over and passed away and come back often describe seeing like a web among all other humans going around their lives, as if everyone was actually connected by this energetic force. That is why they say that whatever you put out into the universe will definitely affect those around you, even if you are unaware of it. If you're being hostile and negative, that energy is going to get picked up and vice versa. This is why it's so important that we try to have an intentional effect upon our environment, and not be so controlled by emotion or mental state or physical state. I've also heard that studies have been done showing that prayer actually does help people, and if you think hateful thoughts about someone or want them dead. This can also actually physically affect a person, probably more so if you're connected to them in some deep way. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. If you liked today's video, you know what to do. A huge thanks as always to my lovely patrons for their constant support. And if you'd like your name at the end of the video, and maybe a few more prizes as well, you can find the link in the description to check out for more info. Thanks everyone. So I hope everyone is doing well this fine July, 3rd of July, isn't it? Second or third, depending on your time zone. So yeah, I hope everyone's doing really, really good. But for now, it's time for me to sign off. So stay safe, stay healthy, stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.